Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. More information is at FarmBureauAdvantage.com. The Remarkable Soybean. From its oil, we get products like ink, candles, and paint. From its meal, we get a high-protein fiber used in foods and animal feeds. Natural soy is replacing chemicals and products you use every day. You can learn more about soybeans at VASoybean.com. American consumers want to know where their food comes from and how it was produced. This week, we take a look at some new procedures involving humane turkey production. Our host will be Dr. Temple Grandin. She's a renowned animal behavior scientist and named by Time Magazine as one of the top 100 most influential people in the world. We also have a story on one of the most agriculturally productive counties in the entire nation. It's right here in Virginia, and one man calls it the last frontier of agriculture on the eastern seaboard. Later in the show, we'll fill you in on an interesting technique called farmscaping. Those stories and more on this episode of Virginia Farming. I'm Jeff Isham. Well, we opened the show this week by focusing on agriculture in Accomack County. Could it be the last frontier of agriculture on the eastern seaboard? Sherry McKinney provides us with a, an in-depth look at this farming community on Virginia's eastern shore where farmers are blessed with some of the most fertile land in the state, sandwiched between two large bodies of water. The eastern shore is part of the Delmarva Peninsula, bordered by the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean, and includes parts of three states. Agriculture and aquaculture thrive here, making Accomack the third largest agricultural county in the state. Agriculture and aquaculture are huge industries to Accomack County here on the eastern shore. Um, right off the top, we grow 25% of Virginia soybeans, um, Accomack County does. Um, we are number one, we're the number one county for production uh, uh, for corn in the state of Virginia. If you live on the eastern shore, you are involved and touched uh, by agriculture in one way, or aquaculture in one way or another. In fact, Accomack County ranks first or second in the state for most field crops. Field crops include soybeans, corn, wheat, and vegetables. They rank second for broiler chicken production with 6.7 million birds on 48 farms. There are 226 farms with more than 77,000 acres in production. And the agriculture industry in Accomack County generates more than $172 million in farm income each year. I refer to the eastern shore of Virginia, Accomack County as the last frontier of the eastern seaboard. And we have the Chesapeake Bay to our west and the Atlantic Ocean to our east and has a moderating effect on our weather here and also our proximity to the markets. You know, you can't go into town in any part of any town and not see a roadside stand. Um, you can get fresh vegetables. Um, you can get, um, you know, you can even go into Walmart and get local uh, Accomack County, Dublin Farms potatoes. You can even get C&E Farm snap beans. And, and that's local, local vegetables grown here on the Eastern Shore for Eastern Shore consumers to receive. While agriculture is the largest industry in Accomack County, federal regulations have changed what is grown on area farms. Farmers who were once large-scale vegetable growers, like Gale, are now growing grains, keeping their family farms in production. I have seen uh, more row crop production. The tomato production has reduced in acreage, and uh, we're trying to expand our opportunities here. For example, last year I grew canola uh, for Purdue. Primarily, I would say it is due to the effects of NAFTA, uh, the majority of tomatoes that we see in the local grocery stores are from Canada and Mexico. There is a good amount of local produce and that's why people are accessing the uh, 
local farmers markets. The Eastern Shore used to produce, you know, upwards of um, over 60 percent of 60 percent or over of, of the vegetables in the state of Virginia. Um, now we're seeing um, more row crops, um, but you know that's also um, the food safety and and labor ha played a part in that. While farmers continue to work hard to keep their lands productive, another industry in the area is helping boost the bottom line. Tourism on the county's Chincoteague and Ossateague Islands open up new opportunities for growers. Anybody with a, a cornfield typically has a, um, a corn maze, or if you've got some pumpkins, you've got to pick your own pumpkin patch, and we've got a large um, blueberry pick your own. Um, so uh, agri there's some agritourism here in Accomack County. Keeping the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic clean is important to area farmers. Most growers use best management practices on their farms, which helps to to keep waterways healthy and clean and in turn keeps their farmland productive. It means a lot to me in that of course I, my son is working with me in the farm operation and it's a great place for families to grow up and uh, and live. Well it is nice when I ride up and down this field behind me and get to look out on the ocean. Uh, particularly early in the morning. It's very, very pretty. Pride for the land runs deep through Accomack County and the farmers here are looking forward to seeing agriculture continue to thrive for the next generation. Protecting the environment, adapting to changing markets and working hand in hand with the community is helping keep their communities and agriculture strong. Reporting in Accomack County, I'm Sherry McKinney. Thank you, Sherry, for that most interesting report. And here's a big old salute to the farming community of Accomack County on Virginia's eastern shore. Well, we have a special edition of Ag Insights for you this week. A renowned animal behavior scientist, Dr. Temple Grandin, will be demonstrating various aspects of humane turkey production. Dr. Grandin appeared on our show several years ago, and it's a pleasure to welcome her back to Virginia farming, uh, even though it's not in person. On this occasion, Dr. Grandin takes us on a tour of a, a modern turkey farm and processing plant. We'd like to thank the National Turkey Federation and the American Meat Institute for their cooperation in providing this video. It's coming up next on Ag Insights. I'm Temple Grandin, I'm professor of animal science at Colorado State University. This is a large barn full of turkeys uh, ready for market. And we're gonna be showing how they load the turkeys and they kind of, they're gonna be herding them like cattle. They go up a conveyor and then uh, show them going through the whole entire process. I am really um, pleased that we've got this opportunity today to um, see this barn full of turkeys and we're going to watch them being loaded onto the trucks tonight and going on through the processing plant. And it's just not possible to bring tour groups for all of these places because of disease requirements. I have to wear these clothes and then I had to be away from all birds for over a week before I was allowed to come here because you got to be really careful not to bring in diseases. These are typical uh, large uh, sheds where turkeys are raised uh, for up to uh, 1921 weeks. Uh, today we're going to be loading out uh, from uh, one of these barns. The question that came up was, are the turkeys in the buildings afraid of people? Well, if people regularly walk through the barn and get the turkeys used to people walking through them, they'll come up to you. I mean, I had males displaying to me and showing off to me. Birds that are afraid don't 
do that. On a really good farm, a person will walk through the entire building, walking through the turkeys, the whole entire building, to inspect for animals that might be sick, animals that might be injured. It gets the birds accustomed to people walking through them. These sheds have curtains on the sides so they can be uh, opened up in summertime to keep the building cool, close them up in the wintertime. Those are the waterers. And when the birds are loaded out, the waterers are left on. It's always important, always have access to water. You can see right here we have a lot of space. They have not started to load out yet. This is a normal stocking. You get into a building that's overstocked, you wouldn't have this amount of space in market-ready birds. They're getting the truck backed up now, and they've got some wood panels uh, set up in kind of a funnel. And then the uh, truck loaders will come in and move small groups of turkeys, similar to moving cattle, up in small groups, and they jump on the conveyor, ride up into the conveyor into the truck. What they're doing is bringing up groups of turkeys, and there's a conveyor in there, and the turkeys ride up the conveyor into the truck. As the birds ride up this conveyor, they remain upright. They will stand on the conveyor as they go up and be loaded into compartments. So this whole entire conveyor can be raised up and down to load the different level compartments on the truck. One of the advantages of using a machine like this is it doesn't get tired. People get tired and these birds are really, really heavy. Notice that there's an operator there and he's controlling this. And then he's got to go back and shut the doors. But I want to emphasize Good equipment makes it easier to have good handling, but you also have to have management. They've got to make sure they operate this equipment correctly. The equipment we have now today is uh, such a big advantage over what we used to have. This uh, turkey conveyor is a really big improvement. This is a truck arriving at the um, plant after loading at the farm and a plant employee is gonna inspect the load of turkeys to make sure they were loaded correctly, make sure they didn't have trapped wings or other obvious problems. The next step is to weigh the truck with all the birds in it. And then after the birds are unloaded at the plant, the empty truck is weighed so they can get accurate weights. Another really important part of this is record keeping. And the um, plant employee here at the computer is entering the uh, name of the farm, name of the loading crew, time that the load arrived. This is all really important information for tracking down problems. The truck is backed into a holding shed, which is equipped with a big bank of fans. One whole side is just solid fans. And it has misters to blow on the birds to keep them cool. It's extremely important not to let them get overheated. In the summertime, the trucks have completely open sides. You've got to have that for ventilation when it's 90, 100 degrees hot Fahrenheit. In the wintertime, the birds would get too cold if they were in open trailers. So fiberglass panels are put into the side of the trailer so that the birds do not get cold. In the summertime, it would be too hot to have the sides of the trailer covered. The um, trailer with the birds in it is pulled into the unloading bay.
the birds emerge from the stunner, you will have uh, some twitching and movement, but you have to make sure there's no blinking. And when I'm training people to audit electrical stunning, I say go out into the holding shed. I want you to look at the live birds in the holding shed and see what a natural blink looks like. This shows the anesthetized turkeys emerging from the controlled atmosphere stunner. And then the employees will uh, place these birds on the shackles. You can see the heads are very limp. They're coming out completely limp. Now, if a turkey was actually fully conscious, he would put his head up like this. That's the position they would be in if they're fully conscious. If the turkey's got a, neck, a long neck, it will, it will curl up like this. The next step is birds go through an automated bleeding machine. Uh, any bird that missed the automatic cutter would be cut by the backup man because it's absolutely essential that all birds are cut before they go into the scalder because we absolutely have to make sure that live birds never go into the scalder. The birds are now emerging from the uh, scalder, have had their feathers uh, softened up by the scalder. And then the next step is to go into the picking machine, which has a whole lot of rubber fingers that rotate that take off the feathers. There are a few little bits and pieces of feathers still attached and employees on the line will remove those. And then the next step is to put them on a different type of shackle that just um, holds them by the drumsticks uh, because the uh, feet have been removed. And then they go further on down the process where the insides are taken out. The first step in making sure that the carcasses stay clean is a hose that's used to evacuate the feces. It's very important to avoid fecal contamination on the carcass. And then as the turkeys move down the line, the innards are removed in varying steps. And it's really important during these steps to not rupture and break the innards because again, that would contaminate the carcass. Many of these processes are done by hand in turkeys. Uh, this would be very similar to pork processing plant. In chickens, a lot of these processes are highly, highly automated. But in turkeys, they're bigger, the lines are slower. So these uh, you know, step-by-step -step process of carefully removing the innards is done by hand. At this point, there is a USDA inspection station where the innards of the bird are inspected. In all types of uh, meat processing, you don't want to waste anything. So all different parts of the animal get different uses. At this point, they're cleaning out any remnants that might be left after the innards have been re completely removed. There's an employee that does checks for, um, for carcass defects. This is a really important part of the plant's quality assurance program. Also, it's part of continuous improvement. These sorts of inspections are really important for ensuring quality product. This shows turkeys going into a chiller tank to get chilled. And this particular plant uses a water bath chilling. The turkeys are chilled for five hours. The birds are emerging from the chiller. Gonna have to be um, rehung back up on the shackles so they can go into, uh, into the deboning line and be taken apart. Another really important part of maintaining good animal welfare at the poultry processing plant is auditing. Measuring things like bruises, stunning efficacy, broken wings, damaged legs. Because you manage the things that you measure. So auditing is a really important part of good animal welfare. I get asked all the time, do I eat meat? <laughs> yes, I do. I'll eat turkey, beef, chicken, pork, all of the different animal proteins. And I feel very strongly we got to do things right. If you're interested in more information, you have lots more information on animal meat plant issues at my website, www.grandon.com.
Have you ever heard of the term farmscaping? It's a very interesting technique as we learn from the ground up with Chris Mullins. Well, hi and welcome. Today we're at Fauquier Education Farm near Warrington, Virginia. We're here with Mr. Jim Hankins. He's the executive director of the farm here. Jim, thanks for letting us come out here today to talk about farmscaping. Now, people might have heard that term. They might want to use it in their garden, but can you explain a little bit about what farmscaping is? Farmscaping is where you are trying to create a habitat to support a really good diversity of insects within your garden. Okay. You know, you're actually trying to attract insects to your garden. You know, but 90% of the insects that are out there are beneficial. You know, the ones that actually destroy our crops are, are in the minority. And farmscaping is creating that sort of habitat, making sure that you're giving those good bugs the things that they need. Okay. One of the essential things is the types of flowers. You know, there's a one little bug that we have really common here called a surfid fly. A surfid fly adult feeds off of these sunflowers, feeds off of the other flowers that I'm planting, but it's laying its eggs on their vegetables. A surfeit fly larva will eat 60 aphids a day. Oh, wow. And they can have 10 generations in the summer. And then there is a whole host of predatory wasp, good pollinators, you know, good habitat for praying mantises, you know, just dedicating a little bit of your space throughout your garden to encourage the good bugs. Sure, that makes sense. And you've got some beautiful flowers here. What, what kind of plants do you have in this planting that attracts some of those things? Well, the sunflowers here, it's literally just a bag of bird seed from the local co-op. You know, I bought a 50 pound bag of bird, of black oil sunflower seed. I tilled the soil, broadcast the seed, tilled the soil one more time to cover them up. I also threw in some cosmos, some zinnias, and some Mexican sunflowers in this patch. Okay. Because the sunflowers, they come up and go pretty quickly. So, you know, these other flowers will continue to bloom until the frost. Right. You know, I've got four different patches of sunflowers so that I'm keeping a new section in bloom all of the time to really hold those good bugs in here. Makes sense, and most gardeners would want to have would want to have those good insects all throughout the summer when they're growing their vegetable crops. Yeah, crop. you, you need them from early spring all the way up, you know. And you can even leave these sunflower stems. If you leave them out during the winter, right. there are a lot of the really good ground nesting bees and predatory insects that overwinter inside the stems of these plants. Plus, you've got goldfinches, and it looks beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. It probably won't eliminate all pests, right. but you're creating a good natural habitat where nature's more in balance. Yes. You know, when you've got, when it's monoculture, a whole field of one crop, then the only insects that are gonna be in there are the bugs that are gonna eat that one crop. By creating this good, healthy, diverse habitat, you get a wider range of all the good ones who reduce the number of the bad ones that we're, you sure. know. Makes perfect sense. Yep. Well, thank you so much for letting us come out today and see this farmscaping you've got going on. It's a pleasure. Well, for more information about farmscaping, please contact your local county extension office and talk to a master gardener. For From the Ground Up, I'm Chris Mullins. We'll see you next time. Our pearl of wisdom this week comes from Alexander Graham Bell, who once said, before anything else, Preparation is the key to success. Submit your own Pearl of Wisdom through our website at virginiafarming.com. That does it for our show this week. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Jeff Ishy for Virginia Farming. 90 years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, and there's a local Farm Bureau in every county. More information is at vafarmbureau.org. Virginia soybean farmers are hard at work growing soybeans to produce products you use every day. Candles, soaps, even crayons can be made from soybeans. Remember, when you buy soy, you're helping to support American jobs, the economy, and our nation's energy security.